Before we begin, I want to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Revenue Cat. Revenue Cat makes it easy for app developers to build, analyze, and grow in app purchases and subscriptions, whether on iOS, Android, or the web. There's no server or code required. With a few lines of code, get in app purchase infrastructure analytics and integrations without managing servers. Check out their YouTube channel, which is linked below, if you want more details on how to get started once you've signed up. They also have some great reporting tools that automate and be able to look at some of the analytics with your subscribers and subscriptions, customer lists, filters, and segments. If you're going to do anything with in-app purchases, then this is definitely the way to go. Check out revenuecat.com for more details, or like I said, their YouTube channel in the link below. It's the go-to for getting in-app purchases set up in your app and being able to give you the time you need to focus on your app. Thank you, Revenue Cat, for sponsoring today's episode. Welcome to another episode of Empower Apps. I'm your host, Leo Dian. Today, I am joined by, again by Peter with him. Peter, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Leo. I'm so glad to be back with you. It's been too long, my friend. Uh, as people may know, my my schedule has been a bit crazy dealing with the death of the family and a birth of the family. So uh, really glad you were flexible and able to come on today uh, to talk about this very special episode. I wouldn't do it with anybody else because... Oh, thank you. Um, I, well, we'll see, we'll see about the thank you because <laughs> I uh, wanted you to come back after about six months. We did our dub dub DC episode and we're, this is the last episode of the year. So I figured like, I actually went and listened to that episode and kind of like took some notes as far as what we had talked about from dub dub DC 2021 and where we are at the end of the year with a lot of the stuff that they had talked about. Um, mm -hmm. before we get into that, I probably should let you introduce yourself. So go ahead and do that. Sure. So I'm Peter Whitten. For those of you that, that don't know me, I'm compile Swift everywhere at this point. That's, that's basically what I say. Um, I'm a mobile software engineer and, and, uh, manager. So I, you know, live mobile every day of the week, uh, for better or worse. Um, you know, very passionate about Swift, obviously, hence the compile Swift. And anything development-wise on the Apple platforms, that's that's pretty much what I do. So um, I wanted to have you back on for our last episode of the year because I wanted to touch base on what we had talked about last uh, on our last time you were on when we did Dub Dub DC, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you were able to listen to our episode, but I did. What, what's yeah. you okay? So what's your like initial thoughts listening to it like six months later? So I think, first of all, you know, we were very, we were much younger then and we were much more optimistic <laughs> about these things. <laughs> we, we still believed we were, we were in the bubble, right? Now, yeah. um, I think, you know, when I went back and listened to the episode, I thought, you know, it's a tough year because we got a lot, you know, we got some things didn't come through, but we also got a, a lot of huge pluses. And so I'm going to say overall, I didn't think we did too badly. And it wasn't our fault. And I think I've got it covered at that point, right? <laughs> there were a lot of things that they talked about at WWDC that um, I feel like I'm still not totally clear on where they stand. And we'll get into that. But like, mm -hmm. they're, we're still like, I think maybe we might get these in the 2.2 version of iOS, but there's a lot of features that just haven't come to full fruition. Um, and I think that's kind of the big thing I kind of got out of listening to our episodes. Like, oh, yeah, I remember them talking about that. Whatever happened yeah. to that? Like, and that's kind of like mm -hmm. my biggest, biggest, like, thing that I have um, gathered based on listening to our episode. One thing I wanted to ask, though, do you think that for 2022, do you think WWDC will be a remote again? That's a tough one. If, if you'd have asked me about a month ago, I'd have said, you know what? I think Apple might try and, and do a, you know, some kind of in-person hybrid event. Then I thought about it again. And I thought to myself, maybe not. Because I think, you know, th this, in some ways, the remote conference has totally played into what Apple likes to do and arguably what they do best, which is perfect the presentation without the risk of something going wrong live, 
right? Yeah, that's true. And, and you know, I'm certainly one of those people, and I know we've, we, you know, you and I have spoken about this, and, the, you know, the, the the video, the content that they've put out over the remote conferences, I feel has been better as far as the talks and all of those kind of things. But the huge component for WWDC is always the social aspect. And, you know, without that, it very much doesn't feel like a community thing, right? And so, right. Uh, you know, I'd like to see at some kind of in-person thing. I don't know if it'll be Apple that does it, though, uh, yet. Certainly not next year, maybe. Right. No, I'm with you on that. Like, I don't know if Apple thinks there's much to gain by having a live conference. Like, I could see how them going back to doing maybe like live press conference things where it's mm-hmm. like, oh, we have, you know, a new iPad or a new MacBook or a new Mac. Like, I could possibly see that. But we're like, part of it isn't just the virus and the effects of it, but we're in a. It's a different Apple and it's a different age. Mm -hmm. And like there's the the live event thing is a very, very weird thing for people outside of Apple 10 or 15 years ago. But they had Steve, so it made more sense. Whereas now Mm -hmm. it's like Apple's you must like much bigger company. And then on top of it, we have the virus and on top of it, like they can perfect their presentation, like you said. So it's like, yeah. what, what's the incentive for them to like keep doing live, live things. Now, have you done any of the tech presentations that went on over November and December and October? You know what I'm talking about? No. Yeah, I do. And no, I haven't, which I okay. actually wanted to do, you know, um, thankfully, you know, I, through some of the places that we both, you know, exist online. I've got to see how it's gone for other people. Um, I wanted to do some. And in general, it seems like it's very favorable. You know, I was, uh, like, for example, I was listening to uh, Core Intuition with Daniel Jalcott. And, um, you know, I think he was he was talking about how he, you know, attended one. And um, it was, I don't want to use the word weird, but a little different because it was a different format for, for Apple. And right. how it was kind of a many to one, but felt like a one to one kind of thing, which I thought was interesting. But I, I do hope that they do more of these as well, because if there's one thing that I think is fantastic about Apple is it's all its engineers. Right. Right. And so being able to, to talk with those engineers and, you know, express problems or um concerns and then also get the feedback on issues on that one to one i think is so beneficial on both sides that you still wouldn't get from the conference because you know it's that okay we can gi- we essentially can give you 5 minutes and then we got to move on to someone else you know right yeah you know. i think How about like you? did you I get like, to go in i did yeah and yeah. i like them i think they there's some limitations to to them over the presentations but there's also gains with the fact that you can actually ask the engineering staff and like what you don't get with a one-on-one and what you don't get with the presentation videos is hearing other people ask questions because to me, I find that Mm. interesting to like see, Oh, interesting. People are doing this with this API and like, Oh, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that issue. And then you get to hear the actual engineers answer those questions. And that to me is like yeah. really helpful. Um, besides the fact that you can actually ask questions too. Um, I wish yeah. they wouldn't use WebEx, but that's that's a whole other story. <laughs> I, I admit, when I saw the, you know, saw the details and that coming through, I did stop and and I thought to myself, you know, and I guess this is always the thing with a lot of Apple things, I thought. Right. Uh, WebEx using someone else's service isn't this the perfect time to promote FaceTime? You know, um, <laughs> right? You know, right? No, totally. <laughs> and, but they do these, and, and I get it because it's you know, to, to their credit too. Maybe they're not thinking this, but I'd be thinking, well, you know, someone else has the infrastructure in place already. You know, uh, let's go with that until we have our own one. You know, right, right, exactly. It is a little unusual sometimes when it is an area where it's like, Apple, you can do this. Why are you not doing this yourself? You know. So what do you think will be the big thing next year? Like every year we had, like, except for maybe, except for maybe this year, 
do you think there will be a big thing next year? And what do you think it could be? I, I'm going to, I'm going to totally go out on a limb here. And next year, you know, when we get together for Dub Dub and, and however that may be, I'll be like, oh, I was so wrong. Well, nailed it. Um, I think <laughs> it's going to be, you know, the year for the glasses. And I know yeah. like all Apple things, it's been going for years and years and years. One crucial difference this year, you know, Facebook did their thing, right? And Microsoft, you know, Apple, they don't, yeah, Microsoft, you know, Apple doesn't necessarily want to be, you know, they don't mind not first. being first. They want to be the best, but they don't like waiting too long. And right. I got a feeling that next year, whether it's ready to ship or not, we're going to see some glasses. Yeah, you're right. I think you're 100% the problem right. I'm, Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was going to say the problem becomes very much like the watch. Uh, okay. And what do the glasses give us? That's going to be the, the thing, right? It's one thing to deliver. As it's another thing to deliver. As consumers or developers? What can I use? Uh, as developers, I think we're, we're probably going to be okay. I'm betting okay. they'll probably be locked down at first like the iPhone, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Um, but as consumers, I think the problem becomes you know, very much like the watch, right, is still so many people even today saying, well, what do I use this thing for, right? What right. does it give me that my iPhone doesn't? Because for years you told me the iPhone was everything, you know. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know. You know, I think like, yeah, I think the AR glasses are going to be the same thing where we feel like with with the watch, I think – Apple didn't know what the watch was for. Like, if you look, listen to that for first presentation from 2015 or 2014, like, they thought, oh, we're going to send heartbeats and we're going to, like, this is what the side button is for. Like, they've changed a lot. And now I feel like they've got a good idea of, of what the watch is for. It's like a lot of it is health and fitness and notifications, right? That's pretty much what it's used yep. for. And I kind of have the idea that like the AR glasses are going to be the same thing where it's like, oh, we can use it for everything. It'll replace your iPhone and, you know, give it another five, 10 years. I think they'll have a better idea of what these glasses will actually do. And I think yeah. that's kind of the, the the way it's going to go. I, I kind of don't think there's a lot of ideas that the AR glasses are going to replace the iPhone. I don't think that's mm -hmm. going to be the case, like at least for the first few years. I think they're going to be uh, like like the watch. It's going to be something you need along with the iPhone, and they kind of work together. But yeah, I kind of I kind of agree with you. I think this is going to be the year for the AR glasses. A lot of rumors have been pointing in that direction, so I wouldn't. I'm not going to be surprised if it happens, but I won't be surprised, I guess, if it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, I think you know very much like you say, like with the watch. Um, if Apple is you know continues to sort of follow their pattern, whether it's intentional or unintentional. I, I guess I almost hope it's intentional, which is <laughs> to keep the iPhone being the, the central hub for all things. And everything, you know, like the watch, the glasses, will branch off of that because, you know, um, if I was to put, a, you know, kind of more of an investor head on, not that I have any investment in Apple, they get enough <laughs> of my money, but I don't get anything back from it, um, <laughs> is, you know, Eventually, as we're seeing, those iPhone sales, you know, th let's be honest, I'm not, you know, they're never going to be terrible, but they're going to they're going to start to more and more flatline, right? You can only sell right. so many exactly. phones and you need other things like, for example, the watch. Well, if you want the watch up until recently, you had to have the phone. It makes sense to do the same thing with the glasses. And you've got this huge power in the iPhone. Let the iPhone do the heavy lifting and let, for example, the glasses just be the presentation layer, right? Yeah, totally. I agree completely. Do you think that one, one question that I had, and I don't know if you were able to think about it, but do you think that Apple is going to acquire anybody in the next year or so? I did think about that. When, you, when, you, when I saw that in the notes, I was like, oh, this is my opportunity to create my perfect world. And, um, you know, again, I thought, oh, Okay, maybe maybe this is the year they acquire Dropbox. That's not going to happen. But um, I'd love for them to do something like that because I still feel their their cloud, um, you know, syncing file storage is in a very weird spot still. As yeah, much as right. I love iCloud, and I do. I mean, I use i you know iCloud to sync everything. 
I use it for storage and, and all of that stuff. But it's still in a weird spot because they're more expensive than other folks for a very small amount of storage. And its reliability has gotten a lot better. But it's really now at a point of, you know, where you look at it and go, well, this is how it's supposed to have worked years ago, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, and I think that's the problem there. So I'd what? like to see them acquire something like that. One thing like that they lack is like API for iCloud. Mm. And what I mean by that is like they don't have the robust API that Google or Microsoft has when it comes to their office suite. Um, like there's no way to like edit a numbers document in iCloud with a web API. I, yeah, okay, maybe with like Apple Script, which is dead, but like there's <laughs> no way to do that right now when it comes to like if you want to sync documents or you want to like put together a spreadsheet or something like that, they don't have anything yeah. like that. So I definitely could see like something like that a little bit more robust uh, in that space. And like the syncing stuff and sharing still on Apple is still a mixed bag, at least for me, it is when it comes to like sharing notes mm -hmm. or anything like that. So yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. That definitely could be yeah. wanting. I, the thing I had down was something in either fitness or gaming or health. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think like they, they want to keep making more inroads and there's kind of been this rumor in the back that they want to make a console. So I don't know if there's like any way that Apple would, would like hire develop, like actually I could hire like a development studio or something like that mm -hmm. because like they definitely want to make that inroad. And if AR glasses are part of that, you know, I could see that. Or obviously AR glasses, they could go more of the business route. I don't know, but we'll see. Yeah, I think, you know, I think you hit two things that, you know, I do definitely want to comment on there. Um, acquiring a game studio, I think, you know, if it's not in their path, I would not be surprised if it gets announced, right? Think about it. Right. They're making TV programs now and all of this stuff on Apple Plus. The right. um, It makes perfect sense to have a game studio and given the way that we see the hardware going, and let's be honest, you know, the phenomenal performance of the, the Apple Silicon, the, you know, I, I'll go out on a limb, although I'm really not the first here, the Apple TV is the console. They just have not right. figured out the software yet. Right. right. That's and totally where that's going. And they're kicking and screaming, like, to try to get games that don't require the remote. Like, I remember that being a big issue. So it's like, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And, you know, on that, just quickly, I so I love my Apple TV. I mean, I you know, it's 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 my central hub for terrestrial television and everything. But every time I have tried to play, you know, a game uh, that I play on my iOS device, somehow when I get to the Apple TV, it just becomes this frustration of, yeah, you know, looks fantastic, performs fantastic. Unless I go get a third party controller, I, I just cannot interact with this thing like I can when I've got a phone in my hand. And, you know, it's funny because I was on my live stream at the weekend and uh, we were talking about, you know, I made making some cross-platform stuff. And then one of the people in the chat room said, oh, don't forget the Apple TV. And then <laughs> I realized it's like, oh, yeah, TV OS, that's a thing, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, because <laughs> it really doesn't yeah, feel exactly. like it's a thing, you know. Um, and we, then we were joking about games and that on there. And I think that's the problem is, you know, Apple's got the hardware. So many times have we heard this, right? Apple's got the hardware, but they cannot figure out how to make it work with the software or get the developers to take it on board and say, sure, I'll make you some Apple TV stuff, you know? Right. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So what, let's start with some of the stuff they talked about at WWDC this year and see maybe mm -hmm. where things are going. The yeah. first thing I had on my list was the iPad. Uh, mm -hmm. what are, I'll let you start. What do you think about okay. iPad and iPad OS 15? Yeah. So um, as we go here, I'm going to confess as I go, right? So, because I did a lot of upgrades this year, I have the M1, um, iPad, you know, similar story nice. to the, like, I was just saying the hardware from the hardware perspective, fantastic. I mean, I think they did everything, you know, to make this thing a, a true powerhouse it is amazing to me the the potential I will say for what the iPad can do from a hardware perspective. Uh, iPad OS fifteen, 
was a nice upgrade this year for sure. I mean, it is definitely okay, you are making inroads in the right direction. But as always with the iPad and especially the OS, you know, we can rule out hardware issue at this point because the hardware is just always going to be more powerful, frankly, than the OS can take care, you know, take advantage of. Um, mm-hmm. The problem becomes the software. And this issue that I find every year I say to myself, maybe this is the year for, for, for like, great, I can do everything on my iPad except Xcode. We, we should definitely, you know, well, we won't touch that one just yet. But, um, right, right. you know, the, the problem is then I sit down with it and I'm like, oh, Apple, why do you keep preventing the iPad from being what it can be? Because I think the iPad OS, you know, I am one of those folks where it's like, don't give me Mac OS on it, but right. give me something in between because I can't do the true power things without this weird system of sending between apps. And at some point, they've got to let that security, um, they're, they're slightly paranoid, I think, about, you know, it's a good platform, works great, but we don't want to let these things talk to each other. And that's what's continues to be the problem with, with iPad OS. So give me an example of where you get burned on it. Yeah. So for example, right, you know, it, it, a regular flow that I can do right now is I can record a podcast on my iPad. I can edit it on my iPad. But if I want to make the, you know, if I want to bring in a graphic for the, for the, like the. Album you know, art. Epis- yeah. Thank you. Album art. You know, I got to go to another app and then I got to import it. Um, Some of the apps that I use that record audio, I got to offload them to iCloud and then bring them back into another app. That URL scheme that they came up with is brilliant, but it it prevents the workflow from being natural. And it also requires that apps. So it also requires that third-party apps support it as well, right? That's the thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I want to take this. I want to talk about this a little bit more. So, like, is your album art, do you put that in your files app? Or, like, why is it not yes. accessible easily? Yeah. No, what I have to do is go to some other amazing app, like the Affinity apps, right, on the okay. iPad. Off, yep, offload it that. to my, uh, yeah. So I offload it to my uh, iCloud, you know, the drive, and then go back to my other app, go get it from the drive, right? And, um, you know, do it that way. Now, the other option is that I can do it on my local storage, but it's still the same problem. I got to go from one app to another app. Yes, we have the multitasking where you can drag and drop, which works great, again, if if an app supports it. But it still doesn't feel natural, right? It doesn't have that thing. And I'm not talking about multi-windows. At this point, I'm perfectly comfortable with one or two apps on the screen. Yeah, but that's what I like too. Yeah. Work. yeah, they don't work together like they do when I'm on my Mac and it's like, oh, I can throw the file over here, then bring it back over there. And those little right. things that you just take for granted, right? You know, I think a huge plus was when we got the cursor for sure. Like I've got the magic keyboard thing and I use that touchpad a lot, you know. Okay. Um, but that only gets you so far because, again, some apps don't support it or don't know how to. And so now I'm reaching up for the screen again. Do you know what I mean? It's anything that interrupts my flow of the doing it seems like with files, the get around. Files seems to be a much more central player in the OS, perhaps. And I think maybe that might make communication between apps better. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think... I think it feels like, you know, when files first came along, it was their way of saying, like, here's the central thing. You know, here's the terminal on the iPad like we have on the Mac, right? We all know it's there, but only those power users dive in and use it. Files kind of felt a bit like that in a safe way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great, and it's a good plan. But, um, you know, it is nice that it it almost acts like an open and safe dialogue for the most part if third parties support it. And that's always going to be the thing is you've got to get the third parties on board. Well, otherwise I think it like work. a big, in my opinion, I think the biggest problem with the iPad is more of like the developer model 
um, which goes into another thing we'll talk about later. But like, I think there's not a lot of like financial incentive for a lot of developers to really make a robust iPad app. I think that's the biggest blocker. I think that's honestly like the biggest blocker because, oh, and also Apple hasn't really shown us. Oh, we'll talk about in a little bit, like how they could show us, but there is no Final Cut Pro. There is no logic on the iPad. And I know like there's a lot more work Adobe certainly has put in to building Photoshop on the iPad and stuff like that. But I think like Apple needs to build more pro apps for the iPad to really show how useful it can be. Yeah, yeah, and and, and, and so, incentivize and incentivize financially. They're develop those developers <clears throat> on the iPad. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There they, is definitely go on. Yeah, no, they they price they price the App Store way too low, and like it, oh, the iPad really got yeah. hurt by that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I think no question, and you know, I know I've certainly done a couple of podcasts, and I I think we've even spoke to them about how the worst thing ever was the 99 cents. I mean, it's like, okay, well, developers, you might as well just give it away for free at this point. <laughs> and I get it. Why should you, right? You shouldn't give right. it away for free. You know, that's always right. been my thing is it's going to be us, the developers and the app makers that have to correct this problem, right? It's not going to be anyone else doing it for us because, you know, Apple's not going to turn around and say, okay, you know what, users, there's now a minimum price of $199. That's not going to happen, right? Right. You know, exactly. they get, and, and we should, you know, without getting down a rabbit hole, they get their cut either way, right? Right. And right. someone's already paid $1,000 for the hardware. So, you know, good luck with that. <laughs> right. Um, but you're right. You know, the, the, there are some key apps that I think that show that in some ways the iPad is not taken seriously by some of the big names. I'll give you a perfect example. You know, I'm a photographer, as you know. Um, love my photography, yet I don't have an iPad version of Instagram. I have a 2X version of the iOS still, right? As long yeah. as that happens, right? You, this is the green light that says, you know what, huge companies, you don't need to make an iPad version, and that's the problem. Yeah, agreed. So let's talk about one iPad app, or I guess a new update to the iPad app, and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll get into more, but we have, well, I'll get into this first. We have the re- pending release of Xcode 13.2, um, and mm-hmm. there were two big features that they a- added. Um, one feature that looks like we're finally going to get something from WWDC, and that's the uh, so-called Xcode on the iPad that we were so excited mm-hmm. about. Uh, mm-hmm. But basically, Playgrounds can build apps, um, and it looks like Extra yeah. 13 supports those Playgrounds. Did you get an invite for that beta by any chance? I didn't, but I'm all okay. for this. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I haven't really – I've been using 13.2, but I have not been using any of the Playground features that I mm-hmm. think that they're talking about. But it looks like we might have Playgrounds that actually can build apps in the next – couple of months, maybe even by the end, by yeah. the time this re- episode is released. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be really interesting. I wouldn't count like, on that. Gonna really be- <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be, it'll be December 31st. It'll be at the very end <laughs> of the year. Um, yeah, it's, it's taken a while and I'm glad they're taking their time with it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll get, we'll get actual playgrounds that can build apps on the iPad. That'll be really interesting. Yeah, I think it's actually, you know, it plays into what we were talking about with the iPad, right? There, There is not enough incentive for me as a developer or a hardcore uh, user to, right. you know, look at it and go, well, why would I use this when I know I've got my super powerful Mac sitting here? Um, but, you know, I think that the Swift Playgrounds app on iPad has already come a long way. Certainly when this drops, um, you know, before December 31st, <laughs> um, it's it's going to be big. I mean, I will certainly be using it because mm-hmm. we yeah, all know this as developers. Out. Yeah, you you have, you know, you, you have the ideas when you're not sitting in front of your machine. Well, if I've got my iPad in my bag, great. I, got, I know enough coding that I can spin it up. I don't expect, you know, if, if I have to generate code that puts a view and the preview and things like that, fine, you know, no problem at all. And then I can do a little, even if I'm doing some Swift UI layout stuff, right? You know, all of these kind of things, fine, that works for me. The, the I think the next logical step 
is, as I, you know, I know we had spoken about it way back, is, okay, well then offload the heavy lifting of the build, even though we've got a powerful chip in the iPad to do it. Give right. me this famed Xcode cloud. <laughs> I'll just kick the code up in a commit, let it take care of everything. So, you can come back in test flight and I can run it. One thing I, I when I was listening to our episode, did you do you know for a fact, like I would assume you can just build these apps on the iPad itself. I, I don't think you would need the cloud. Did you, did you get confirmation yeah, on that no, either no, way? My, I haven't had confirmation, but I, I feel like, you know, the hardware is there. So right. why would you not just, you know, and the sp- I, I guess the big thing would be the space, right? You've got to right. store all of the compiler and foundation and everything else. But is that such a big deal? I don't think it is. I think yeah, the, I don't think it is anymore. You know, and you're not going to build that mm-hmm. kind of app on the iPad anyways, I would assume. Right. So, right. yeah. Um, but I guess, sorry, the question becomes, though, I may pull down a repo from one of my big apps want to tweak it see i kind of feel like they're going to tell you they're going to give you a warning like this app is way too complicated (laughs) for the ipad like essentially is what they're going to do yeah or or you can't build it but you can like edit a swift ui view or something like that like and do like yeah yeah. maybe that's what it's going to end up being which i guess if you do like previews you kind of have to build the whole app so maybe i'm wrong well yeah we'll see yeah yeah or it'll be the thing of uh you know sort of half-heartedly I still joke about this now, where it comes up and says, uh, "Swift UI doesn't have this this obvious standard control yet. We're working on it. You know, go go yeah, to your right. Mac, right? You know, um, yeah." What was the other thing? Well, I was just going to say, if you want to learn more about playgrounds, definitely check out my episode with Steve uh, from we talked about this and the power of playgrounds. So it'll be interesting to see how far this goes. Um, yeah. And the other, so the other big thing we talked about in Xcode, and we have a big update. Um, we I did that episode with Mara and obviously and Vincent um, on the async await, but like 13.2 will have older OSs. Before I get into that, have you done anything with async and await? I have only played with it a little bit. And the reason okay. being was because at least until, you know, sort of now slash the next final release, uh, because it's been restricted to essentially you've right. got to have the latest OS. And I know that as my user base is like, okay, that's not necessarily the scenario I'm looking at. So it's very much a curiosity for me right now and to play with it, but it's yeah, not like I ship it, you know? Yeah. I, uh, that's kind yeah. of my boat. Even like, I think for most folks who build apps, um, Supporting 14 is fantastic, and I'm glad, and, mm-hmm. and all the 2020 mm-hmm. OSs. But for somebody who develops a lot of stuff with Swift packages, I'm hesitant to start adding async and await because, like, the idea would be is, like, when I build a Swift package, it will work no matter what. Like, Xcode 12, maybe. Like, I don't know. Whatever yeah. whatever yeah. versions of Xcode you might still be using. And I don't know. It's like a judgment call. I'm curious what people people in the audience think but like i kind of would rather mm-hmm. not add async and await and just like maybe add sh- add it add something that'll work around it at some point later but for now like i don't gain much with it necessarily so i don't know i'm still hesitant and like i i, I know they've added async and await to vapor which is awesome that's fantastic yeah. so we know like right. async and await will work on linux fine because we don't have the same issues with with the libraries and all that stuff. But um, yeah, I've, you know, life has been crazy, obviously for me. So I just <laughs> haven't had the time to do async and away. And uh, this is, mm-hmm. you know, for client work, I don't want to support something that is not going to be supported on older OSs. And for Swift packages, I'm a hesitant to like block off all these older versions of Xcode um for yeah. my package to work so like older os is a good first step but i don't i don't know if it's enough for me necessarily to do everything in 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 uh async and await yeah you're right i mean there's a couple of things in there that you know when i'm evaluating for you know the day job and things like that is okay do we do we take the next big step it always is well firstly do we need it um you know async await it for yes Definitely, I would benefit from, you know, handling an awful lot of the network stuff where I got a ton of that going on. And if I can strip out code, fantastic. But I do have to wait and look at the stats and say, but how how much of my user base 
will I either, you know, will either benefit or hurt. And until those numbers say it makes sense, there's just, you know, I'm going to look at it and say, you know, this is a great feature, but I'm going to wait. I think by next year, this will be a very different story, right? We'll, we'll be looking yeah, at it and going, oh, okay, we're, we're good, you know. Um, so, I, and, and to be fair, it does feel like something that Apple said this year. Look, this thing is coming. If you're brave enough to, to play with it now, do so cautiously. But, you know, maybe start planning a year from now to, to rework your code base and simplify, right? Right, right. Well, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did you want to talk about Mac OS Monterey? Oh, yeah, I got some thoughts on it. Yeah. Okay, go for it. I want to hear about it. All right. So um, I had played with the betas on just a, hey, this machine I can use them on, right? Just for the audience, what I normally do every year, and I, you know, this is not unique to me, but I have two, I either have one machine with two drives or two machines. And I have my stable, everything is as good as it gets in production, you know, in air quotes. And my, okay, it doesn't matter if, life goes weird kind of setup. So I ran Monterey for most of the year in that kind of scenario. I had an external drive booted from there and everything else. I did upgrade. Well, two things happened. First of all, I upgraded my M1 Mac Mini when Monterey came out. And then I switched that out for one of the new laptops. We'll probably get to that. Um, At which point I had Monterey anyway. Now, Monterey to me feels like a good, you know, another one of those good, yeah, it says, you know, Mac OS is Mac OS, just like, you know, Windows. And every year you've put things on. It's great. You've made things slightly better. You've introduced some new features that have some issues. You'll work those out. Thank you, Apple, over time. But uh, with regards to the new hardware, I have had more issues, I think, with, you know, Mon- Mac OS Monterey. And I'm hoping it's Monterey and not the hardware. Let me start there. Okay. Um, th- then I, I'm hoping I've had more issues there because of that than I think I've had in recent years with, with Mac OS. You know, it was yeah. great on my Mac Mini M1, for example. You know, I have, I have no complaints. Yeah, my new I feel Mac, like I've had... It's weird. I've had... So I've actually had issues on my iMac. I spoke about this in the oh. last episode with yeah. uh, Guy. Um, like weird Bluetooth issues. This is the mm-hmm. Intel iMac. Um, I don't have that many issues, honestly, on my MacBook Air M1, but like that and like sometimes my desktop picture doesn't show up like it goes black for some reason. I don't know why. Like um, whenever I run. So I I, first I thought it was running simulator, but apparently anytime I start debugging an Xcode, my iMac screen flickers, which is really weird. Oh, that's weird. (laughs) Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it's like I've had a lot. I've had a lot of small issues, nothing that like breaks anything. But like, regardless, they are like these weird quirks that I have to deal with every day um, that have kind of like driven me a bit a bit crazy. Um, And I feel like, oh, the one thing we forgot to mention when we were talking about the iPad is uh, we never got we still haven't gotten universal control, like true universal control, because I would love to use my iPad side by side with with my Mac. Uh, yep. Still don't have that. Side uh, sidecar though was working flawlessly when it, when Monterey was in beta, and now it mm-hmm. stopped working. Um, it now that Monterey is out, I don't know if you've had that issue. Um, I did. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like weird to me. Like these are all issues that have come up after. After it was out of beta, not before it was out of beta. Yep. And like, like it's it's like they fooled you where it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Monterey <laughs> is super stable. Yeah. And then like 12.1 or uh, whatever it is. Yeah. 12.1 or 12.2 or whatever comes out. And it's like, sorry, we broke everything. And I'm like, <laughs> like sidecar was working fine. I'm fine with sidecar if yeah. I don't get universal. But now I don't even have that. So it's like, yeah, it's driving yeah, me crazy. So I, have, I have a couple of thoughts on that. So, um. You're right. You know, you could almost half-heartedly sort of say, like, should I send a note to Apple and say, I'm sorry, did you ship the last beta as the final? Or the f-? Right. Because you're right. The last couple of betas for me were way better than the final release. Right, um, right. You know, Bluetooth on a Mac for me has always been a disaster. I mean, right. I just have so many problems. I almost, you know, I, 
I try to avoid it as much as I can. Other than headphones and my touchpad, uh, everything else is wired because I just can't rely on the fact that it's going to drop off or die or whatever right. it is. Right. I've given up on Bluetooth on Mac. And that's not a criticism of Monterey. That's a criticism of the last few versions of the OS. Yeah. You know. Uh, so so listen to our last episode with Guy because we just uh, we, we okay. talked about I haven't that. Got this and, going. Yeah. Yeah, and uh all the weird quirks with with Bluetooth and the Bluetooth stack, but um yeah, and I fi- I filed bug reports. Like I hardly do it. And I know they tell you to do it, but I have fi- mm-hmm. fly- filed like all sorts of bug reports on these weird issues and it's like I don't know, it goes into the black hole yeah. and we never hear back. So We'll see. Like, I kind of hope, I really hope that they like go like whatever the next thing is called. Uh, you know, I hope they just like make Mac more stable, I think. Yeah. And I know they're trying yeah. to get in that direction. I think like the Apple Silicon thing probably has like thrown a monkey wrench into that because they got to make sure it's ready for a different kind of processor. But I'm kind of thinking like long term having a set like the same more or less processor essentially on all their devices get, is going to help that I would hope. So we'll see. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, that is, you know, one of the smart things that Apple has done is, you know, looked at it and said, Hey, you know, if we run our own hardware, like, like we used to, right. right? If we, if we run our own, you know, system on a chip, put that in all of our systems we have the benefit of knowing what's going on there and and fixing and designing accordingly. But the flip side being, when there is an issue, it actually kind of makes it feel worse because at that point, we're going to turn around, whether we use as developers and say, but Apple, you control the entire stack and you still didn't get this right. You know, mm-hmm. and right. Or, uh, maybe, the, maybe the question or is really, or the statement is more, you didn't get it right, but, you know, and maybe we need to go there on some other discussion someday is, Apple, are you focusing on this platform this year? Because this needs the love, right? You know, um, because there's some of that too. Every year it feels like, well, what's the one that Apple cares about this year? You know, they can't right. give equal love to all of them. Um, and it's I mean, they're shift they definitely, do they've that. shifted definitely towards the Mac, like, mm-hmm. in the last few this years. Has I been think a they're kind of year for sure. Or even Mac years, like I feel like with big ever since Big Sur and Apple Silicon, I certainly mm-hmm. think the Mac has started to get more and more attention. Um, and I think the I- iOS has kind of lost that attention, and fairly enough because I feel like you said it's kind of plateaued. But um, yeah, I, I, I agree completely. And Which one do you want to talk? Because sorry, I was going to say one other crucial thing here is, you know, and this debate often comes up is Apple needs at least a reasonably good Mac platform because that's the platform, the only platform they give you to develop software and everything else for all of their other platforms, right? Right. And I get why they do that and I totally understand. I don't mind that there's no whatever, Windows X code, whatever, you know, makes (laughs) sense. But if you're going to put everything in one place, make sure that's solid because then you're hurting everything else if it doesn't work. Yeah, agreed completely. Uh, what do you, what do you want to talk about next? I have oh, three. Have there's three. Yeah. The three things we could talk about. This one, this one, yeah. or this one. Do we? You know, should we? Should we sort of tease the audience and do the hardware and let them wait for the Xcode cloud a little bit longer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Since we're already talking that? about it, yeah. What's your? So, what is yeah. your situation with your your Max? Right now, so so you know, I've got the 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 MacBook Pro 14 inch with the Max chip, not the highest CPU. The next one down, can't remember which one that okay. is. I think there's three that you can pick from, and this is the middle one. So just to okay. sort of fill out the spec, I got the 32 gig of RAM, one terabyte hard drive. The hardware is, you know, even when I saw the presentation, is yes, this is the Mac that you should have been making for the pros, you know the past few years, right? You know, uh, we could, I won't touch on the whole who designed what thing, although I have right. thoughts on it. But, you know, it's like, oh, look, you put ports back on this thing because you realize that years of everybody saying I need ports was actually a reality, <laughs> you know. 
you gave me MagSafe, which has already saved me a few times, you know. Um, nice. So, yeah, so I'm very happy. You, you know, it's got the HDMI connection that I'm using right now. And it's like, wow, I did not see that coming. So, okay, great. For me, you know, again, with the photography and things like that, putting that SD card slot back on the hardware is the gift from heaven. <laughs> you know, it yeah, really is. Yeah. yeah. Now, beyond that, the, you know, the, the, the speed of the chip and uh, everything else, the M1 was already so good that it's like, look, I already think that, you know, this, this already has more power than I'm using until I do an Xcode build. So I almost don't notice the, the huge amount of extra performance because it was already so good, you know. And it's not like Xcode's ever going to compile in a couple of seconds and make me go, "Woo, that was worth three grand, you know. Right, right, <laughs> um, right. So there's all of that. Now, that said, you know, and, and I do, I do want to say that another big reason I got it was because I had the M1 iPad. That screen was it's incredible. And so to have that on a Mac <laughs> was a real, like, I can't not do that. And what this size way again I'm not did you get? The 14. Okay. But it okay. sure feels bigger than the 14. I got that, you know, that's an interesting thing too. It feels a lot more like the 15, you know, and I certainly don't miss my 17 at this point. Um, <laughs> but all of that said, you know, all, and the battery life, I should mention the battery life is astoundingly good. I mean, I can I can almost go a day on this thing if I'm not doing a bunch of builds. But I've hit one very interesting flaw. Uh, well, actually two, I, I guess I should say. Uh, like many, the upgraded camera is great for if I'm making a video call. I would not use it to do something like this where we want quality because <laughs> the quality is not great. You know, it's, it really isn't. But it's better than what it was. You know, they could, I, I am confident, Leo, they could have done more and put a better camera in this thing still. They just didn't want to, right? You know, now the one problem I have, I can consistently reproduce, and I know you've you've seen me mention this and probably the folks who follow me on Twitter and that, if I put a hub, a USB hub in this thing, I can make it kernel panic in a heartbeat, and I don't know why. And kernel panic, first I, really? Yeah, and I haven't seen I've a kernel never panic in years. I have never had mm. that with with a. I've had issues with hubs and USB uh -huh. devices with the Mac Mac um, my MacBook Air M1, but not a. I've not seen that kernel panic. That's, oh wow! I, I know a way you can spend three grand and have it happen if you want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. You did, know, you um, did you file a bug with this or like? Uh, I, I got to. I can't remember. I think I did because. Um, it's either a kernel panic or the machine just suddenly takes on a life of its own. And, and you know, to give you an idea of how bad this has been for me. Um, is this first I one thought, particular hub or is it like right, any hub? I was going to say, I thought at first, oh, it's, an, it's a self-powered hub. That's my problem. Makes sense. Power management. Move on, right? Okay. Turns out that's not the case, at least for me. I can put powered hubs in this thing and everything can, and get the same result. Um, it's so bad. What the, the worst part is the, when it first started happening, this was, this was literally within the first week of me having the laptop. And I thought, have I got to send this thing back? Because when it started doing it, the machine would then automatically try and reboot itself, but it would reboot, get to the desktop and then crash and reboot. And this cycle, because you have the hub and over. Because you have the hub, hub plugged hub. in. Okay. Yeah. And Did that you take it to an Apple store? It, no, no. And then this was the thing was like, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, is this a hardware thing, you know, or is this a software right. thing? Well, as soon as I um, pull the, the hub out, life is fine, right? Like right. I've, I've, I've not used a hub on it for, gosh, at least a week at this point. It's not happened to me. Um, and it's been solid. So... I don't think, because I've seen other people say that they've had similar issues, which right. makes you feel good and makes you feel bad, depending on which way you look at it. Um, right. So I don't think, I think it's a, maybe a software thing is what I'm hoping, and they can I, just fix it. I would it in think it's way. a software thing. I would almost, yeah, file a bug or like, honestly, I would take it to the Apple store and bring like four different hubs and just show yeah. them the issue. <laughs> Sit there and, and just, just like, hey, what's Just be this? like... Like, act like an idiot and be like, I don't know. Mm. Why is this happening? I think my computer yeah, is broken. Yeah, look, I plugged this in. Yeah, no, it's a yeah, good plan. Yeah, just, just see what they do. 
I mean, the worst come to it, they'll be like, yeah, we'll need to take this in and look at it. And you don't have the laptop. So I don't know how big of a deal that is for you. But like, see, that's the problem because, you know, I was going to talk about one other aspect of this, which was very strange. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and this is maybe a warning for, for everybody here, right? If you do a trade in, like I did, I traded in my M1 Mac Mini. Now, you know, we know there's supply problems. So I understand right. that. The, the trading kit turned up at least, I think it was like two weeks before the laptop did, right? So obviously I'm not going to trade it in because it's like, hey, I got to use yeah. my Mac in the meantime. The problem right. was when my Mac finally got here, you know, and again, I, I accept the, you know, you jump on the early list, you got to wait, things like that. But the problem was I didn't realize all that time the clock was ticking on the trade-in. Oh, so, no. Yeah, so when my laptop turned up, I think it was like the following day I got an email that said, hey, by the way, you've only got seven days left to turn your Mac Mini in. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know. So yeah. uh, this was a very unusual situation. It's like, okay, I, you know, I got to transfer everything, make sure it's okay, get my Mac Mini back in the system in seven days. Right. I mean, I was like, surely this clock should start when I get the Mac, right? Because <laughs> otherwise... Yeah. Well, you know. I think like you probably could get away with just like not doing the trade in until you get your new Mac, because I think the way it works oh, is like yeah. they'll they'll give you the credit back on mm -hmm. whatever however you paid for your new Mac, um, as long as you do it within a certain window after you purchase the Mac. I believe that's the case. So I, I bet you could probably, yeah, I bet you could get away with like waiting until you get the Mac and then trade it in. That's probably the way. Yeah, you could you could you could go about it next time. I don't know. I think you're probably like, right. Yeah, I tried yeah. trading in. I have my 2015 MacBook Pro. I tried trading that in, and yeah, it was like a hundred bucks or something. And I'm like, yeah, that's it's not worth it. It had like that crappy yeah. screen. I don't know if you remember it, but like it can smear easily if you wipe off the whatever oh, coating yeah. they put on it, and like. There was this whole court yeah. case about it too that you can get a cut or they can fix it or something. And that's way in the past. So I, I couldn't do anything about it. So I was just like, all right, I have a CI machine now. And that's pretty much what <laughs> I use my old MacBook Pro for. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you think I should get, okay, let me ask you this. Do you think I should get a new iMac next year or iMac Pro, I guess, if they come out <laughs> with like Apple Silicon iMac Pros? If, if the iMac Pro is still a thing, that's the first question, right? Well, I'm assuming, when, when these, so what I'm assuming yeah. is that there is not going to be like the 27-inch iMac. There's going to be the one that they have now, that's the cheapo one, the 24-inch M1. And then they're going to have the iMac Pro, which is basically either, either basically the old iMac Pro or the 27-inch iMac or some yep. some sort of range there, right? And that's, that's how they're going to differentiate it. That's kind of my guess. Yeah. Yeah, because the problem is that, you know, and, and this is a very real kind of funny problem for Apple is, well, at this point, all of your hardware is so powerful enough, there's almost no bad choice. But there's right. also very difficult to pick, you know, as has been, and I've mentioned this before, Apple used to be wonderful because it's like, I want a machine. Do you want a screen? Okay, an iMac. You know, there's right. only right. one or two sizes of the iPad. They've right. now done what I call the Samsung thing, where it's like, I'm sorry, you have so many different choices at this point, it's a bit of a joke, you know? Right, right. And it's not easy for the consumer because you're quite right, like iMac, iMac Pro and all these things, you know, if I hadn't have needed or wanted to go back to the portability of a laptop and knew that I was getting all this power, I totally would have gone the iMac. So I would say, you know, yeah, next time around, like next year, if, you, if you're looking to upgrade, I think that the iMac is a very safe bet to be happy with. But do you think I you should know? just I should definitely upgrade from my Intel iMac from 2019 or 2018 to the iMac Pro for it, the, the problem you know, Apple Silicon is, and M1 Macs or whatever whatever processor? I, trust me, I've started going down the road of going on the Apple site and like specking it out and be like, okay, oh, this yeah. is how much an yeah. iMac Pro is. This is how much uh, a MacBook Pro with an Apple Silicon. So I'm currently going to spend between X thousand dollars and Y thousand dollars for sure and like budgeting it. Yeah. Yeah. I would, you know, I think, 
I think the iMac or, or iMac Pro is a, is a very safe choice, um, especially as well since we're still living in a world where a lot of folks either working from home or independent yeah. and you've got your studio there, right? So if you're not going anywhere, get the power, yeah, get I the love, beautiful screens, put them on the desk, you know? I love my iMac. It's fantastic. Like, it's totally yeah. worth worth it. I love the big screen and I like, I love desktops. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, my two, okay. just, just very quickly, my two favorite machines yeah. of all time, regardless of platform, still remain, number one, any version of the uh, MacBook Air, best, I just think, best thing ever. Yeah, and I love after that, right yeah, and then after that, the iMac. Uh, same reasons, you know. It's there. It's fantastic. Uh, I remember, you know, going way back when I got the first Intel chip on iMac, and I thought back then was like, this is the revelation, you know. And mm-hmm. so everything yeah. from then on has been fantastic. And that's not even including the fact that I do Apple development. I'd still get that even if I didn't, you know, because they're just beautiful machines. You know, yeah, I re- I love my my MacBook Air. I'm totally glad that I bought it. I'm totally glad that like I bought that and didn't wait for the MacBook Pro. It's mm-hmm. perfectly fine for what I use it for. I don't like, like I said, my heavy duty audio video machine is this iMac here, and my development machine is for just development. When portability um, yeah. is the MacBook Air, and like I that's my setup and I love it and it works and I don't need a MacBook Pro where I want to spend my money is like on a serious desktop. That's going to be awesome. So, yeah, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Um, so you've been uh, one thing I wanted to touch on is I've seen mm-hmm. that you've been doing some and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. But Swift UI, uh, of course, was a big part of WWDC this year and you've been doing some Mac developments, right? Yeah. On Swift UI, yeah. you have a series of videos yeah. on that. So uh-huh. I I have um, in my spare time started dabbling more into Mac development and Swift UI. What's kind of your thoughts on it as you've been working on it? I, I think the Swift UI has made Mac development a much more appealing target for developers and a lot easier to work with too. And and I mean easier in the sense of I don't feel like I'm having to do workarounds for things you know, which has always been a bit of a complaint. You know, with Mac apps, for me, it had always been one of those, do I need to do this? Okay. You know, whereas now Mm -hmm. it's it's a case of, okay, I'm just going to make a new, you know, I don't, maybe I'll make a new uh, UI layer for a Mac app. Everything else just works under the hood. But now with Swift UI, that even doesn't have to really be a thing. I'll give you an example. I did uh, a live stream at the weekend and just for fun, you know, uh, we were like, okay, let's create a Mac app from scratch. And then it very quickly became, let's create a multi-platform app. So in the space of like an hour and a half, you know, I had very basic, but the idea was to just test the theory. I had an app with a UI that was, you know, great, ran on, build it for the Mac, it ran. Build it for any iOS device, it ran. Build it for the watch, and it ran. And so the fact that it's, it's that close now. Mac OS development, I really hope we see a lot of people start to embrace that again, especially now. You know, I, I will say one of the great things about the new Apple chips is when I do bring up, you know, iOS type apps, when they allow it, you know, when, when developers say, yeah, let it be a thing. And it comes up as like an iPad view. It's fantastic. So I hope that Swift UI gets a lot of people thinking about the Mac again from an app perspective. So I kind of agree and I kind of disagree. Okay. So, and I think part of it is your back. Like, did you do a lot of Mac development before you, um, like, got into the Swift UI stuff? No, no. I, I before uh, you know, in fact, even before you know, Swift came along, I. I I wouldn't touch the Mac platform at all okay. because it, it was just a thing I didn't want to have to deal with, you know. I feel like it's it's easy. It's very tempting to get into Swift UI on the Mac. What I find the challenge is building a Mac app using Swift UI that looks like a Mac app. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, no, it I does. Feel like it, yeah. I feel like AppKit has been around so long and these like the patterns as far as how to build a Mac app have been so interlaced with how AppKit works where 
I wouldn't go so far as to say Swift UI, Mac Swift UI is an afterthought, but it certainly is secondary to building an iOS app using oh, Swift UI. Yeah. So like a lot yeah. of the like a lot of the UI things just don't map up correctly to what I would think an app should look like. And so mm -hmm. if that's what I found the hardest thing. It's not like the Swift UI, it's not so much like the Swift UI or the reactive stuff or anything like that. It's more like trying to build an app that looks like an actual Mac app and, and doing it yep. the Mac the right way. And I feel like that's the biggest challenge for me with Swift UI. I do like it and I don't mind dabbling a little bit in AppKit if I need to do like a NS view representable or something. But like it does feel like like I get about like, I don't even want to say 80%, but more like 60%. And then I'm like, okay, like, why is it so hard to do this other 40% that I want? Like rather than yeah. trying to do it the app kit way. And yeah, I've been, <clears throat> so I'll just tell you, like I've been working on redesigning Speculate, right? And it's like, oh. I have some ideas of where I want to take it and like build it more like a real good Mac app and stuff. And I have some ideas. And I'm kind of just like playing with the Swift UI and faking stuff and things like that. And it's like, man, like, why can't I do it? Why can't I make something look like this? Like some mm -hmm. other developer has this app that looks like this. Probably be easier for me to do AppKit, but I'm doing it in Swift UI. Why is it so hard doing it in Swift UI? That's kind of where, yeah. where I get burned on Swift UI on the Mac. Um, yeah, but no, yeah, you, but you gain so much. Yeah. I do agree. You gain so much out of Swift UI. So yeah. Yeah. I, I did as an experiment. Uh, I have a, an app that I wrote for myself, and I've I think I've done videos and certainly spoken about it. You know where I write my blog posts for like Compile Swift. They're they're marked down and just save them and push them to a repo. Well, you know I was, there was so much repetitive tasks in that that I was like, okay, this is a perfect excuse for me to make my own Mac app to do this. And since I have no intention of shipping it. Uh, if it's painful and has some weird things, it's fine. And yeah. so I did originally, you know, with uh, storyboards and everything was fine. And then just recently I thought I should do this with Swift UI. So I wanted to try it out. And, and like you were saying, so I designed the app first in Sketch, I think it was. And it looked okay. very, you know, very like new, what I would call new Mac, right? You know, okay. and, and then translate Did you use the templates from Apple? For Sketch? Uh, I did for a couple of things um, at first, just to lay it out, okay. make sure I got the controls. And then I was like, okay, now design it how I want it to look, right? Okay. And so I did that, and I was like, right, I, this again, I think this was a live stream I did. And then I was like, right, let's convert it over to Swift UI. And I could do it, but um, there was a lot more use of modifiers and a little bit of pain to get exactly yeah. what I wanted. Now, first of all, fantastic that I can do it using modifiers. You know, that's right. great. But you do, you have to think slightly differently than you, you know, would normally expect, like when you make an app and, and do things like that. So I yep. got it to where I needed it to be, but there was definitely some pain points in there. But I, yeah. I guess at the end of it, I was like, okay, but you know what? It proves you can do it. It's a case of, is it worth the effort? And maybe another couple of versions of SwiftUI from now, if they give a lot of love to the Mac side of things, it'll be a lot easier. It's the silly things that you don't think about. Like, you know, I was sort of laughing to myself when I realized there's no SwiftUI control on a Mac for just a standard calendar view, or I couldn't find one. <laughs> and, and it seemed so weird. I was like, how is this a thing? Or how is this not right. a thing? You know? Right. And right. everything I found was like, oh, you got to go make a collection view and all of this. And I was like, well, that's that defeats the purpose, you know? Right, right. And it's so like, there is a little it almost hole. feels like where iOS was in the early days, too, where you'd have to create a custom custom control for it, right? Yes. Um, yeah, and, and, and at I that point, it, I, it, I walk away, you know? It's like, well, why should I do this, right? If, if you're not going to give me the control for it and I'm going to put time into working on something, I'm going to do it with the technology I know because I know it will get me there. You right. Know, Swift UI is like, maybe it will, but I won't know until the end, <laughs> you know. 
Yeah, and I think it like is like what I've said with other guests like Daniel um and stuff is like it depends on where you're at and your like Mac experience. If you're somebody who's just started off doing Mac development, then you don't feel as burnt by switching over mm-hmm. to Swift UI because you have nothing to lose. But if you're somebody yeah. who's been doing app kit for like 20 years, like it probably sucks, honestly, to do Swift UI because you're like <laughs> having to lose so many things just for just for the ease of creating creating controls when you've done it. Like it's probably, you know, second. Yeah, you know, it's, it's instinctual at this point. Well, you know what? Here, here's the thing. And because I know one of my my developers, uh, you know, I know he watches these. So, hey, buddy, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll tell you on this is. If you ever want to feel like your worst day with Swift UI on a Mac was st- or, or any platform was still worth it, go back and try and do it the old way with constraints. And believe me, you will be super happy once you go back and do it with Swift <laughs> UI. <laughs> that is true. That is probably true. <laughs> um yeah, do you okay. Let's uh we got two more topics left. Let's see if we can get this under two hours. Um <laughs> It's been a big year. That's the problem. (laughs) It has been a big year. Um, Yeah. Xcode Cloud. Uh, Have you tried it out? What do you think? I'm still, I filled in my invite. I'm still waiting to hear from it. So I have been living through it by everybody else. Okay. Have you gathered anything from what you've watched? Yeah. I really want to be accepted for it so I can start (laughs) using it. (laughs) I, I've tried it like once and I got into it and I got something set up and it worked and I was like, good, good job me. And then I never yeah. went back <laughs> into it for me. Like I, I really want to do this. I really want to get into it. And um, Josh, who's been on Josh Holt, who maintains fast lane uh, was on and it, which ironically I feel like is kind of the competitive competitor kind of, but not really. Yeah. Um, yeah. He had a really good presentation in Spain on on uh, his experience with Xcode mm-hmm. Cloud. I de- like going back to like actually kind of similar to our kit and Swift UI. I, I have so much experience writing shell scripts to do what Xcode Cloud does, and working okay. with Fastly now, and you're working on other CI systems. I'm not sure I gain anything as an experienced developer switching over to Xcode Cloud, and like that's kind of the thing that that stuck with me. Um, I definitely want to like learn it more and get really into it. And I think there's going to, there's a lot of useful features to it that, but I haven't seen, I have not at a point and that's part of me just not having the time to like really deep dive into it. I'm not convinced that it's worth switching over from say GitHub or GitLab or whatever CI system or build buddy or whatever the plethora of services Mm -hmm. out there to switch over to Xcode cloud. Um, and of course, on top of that, we don't have pricing yet. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, it's not like, I guess it's nice to be able to do everything in Xcode. I, I don't know if I agree with that necessarily, but like, it seems to do a lot of, a lot of the stuff that kind of fast lane does for a lot of folks, but in, 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 in the Apple native build to buddy, uh, environment, I don't know. That's kind of like my yeah. view on Xcode cloud. No, I think you're right in, in many ways. You know, I was watching, uh, I, I watched Josh's video and uh, it was great because it filled in a lot of gaps that I had even after all of my right. research. And my big takeaway from it was, you know, as you mentioned and, I, and as he said, is it is very much a thing of at the end of it, this is great. Do I need it? Right. And I think that the scenarios there are, you know, a series of questions. Right. So, for example, if you already have a, a pre-existing, like you say, some kind of CI/CD system, stick with that. I think you're going to be a lot happier. You know, at least for the first few years, right? Especially as we don't know the pricing. Um, but also, you know, secondly, if you, the, the, I think the huge plus for Xcode Cloud is really I don't have to leave Xcode, which, you know, I say that with a bit of a tongue in cheek. Because as we all know, <laughs> if you've used Xcode for more than a day, there's plenty of times you want to leave Xcode, right? Or <laughs> more, more importantly, based on some, some friends that I know, there's more times when Xcode is going to leave you and just crash. <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> right? That's true. So, well, so definitely you know, not goes, having it, it in there is a good. <laughs> I've seen people like Marin and... Uh, 
um, some other folks who've built like the like we got Sit with Swift Studio for instance, and um, mm-hmm. um, uh, previous guests we've had who've built basically like these IDE competitors to Xcode, and like one of the big problems with Xcode is it does so much. Like it is a yep. massive app that builds like. 25 year old C and C plus plus apps. Like it can yep. do a hundred things. And like, is it really that great of an idea to like add Xcode cloud to it? Like, are we, are we making the same problem we made with iTunes? Right. Where like yeah, I just used are. to do everything. And then they finally were like, okay, we need a separate music app. We need a separate podcast. Yep. app, And it's like, maybe with Xcode, like maybe you guys should put this in a different app because like, that's a lot. It's just a lot of more stuff to have to do in Xcode when I don't want to load up Xcode just to change one little setting on one build. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? And I think, yeah, it goes back to what we were saying about AppKit and Swift UI. It's like, if you've already are experienced with AppKit, you're not going to gain much with Swift UI. If you already have an existing app, but if you've never done any CI, like this is probably a good first step for you to like get into CI. CI is amazing. We did an episode with Kyle, right? Um, about yep. CI. I love CI. I do it with all yep. my Swift packages and apps and plug into Fastlane. Like if it's good for a newbie, I guess, then it's good. To, it's Xcode's better than nothing. And I don't mean that necessarily a bad way, but like it's easy to use. It's easy to get into. And I think I think it's definitely worth it, like to try yeah. out Xcode Cloud, assuming it's free, which I kind of <laughs> doubt. Like, we'll no. see. I, I don't know. I'm not going to make that prediction again, but I yeah. would assume Apple by like March, we'll get an thing. idea. <laughs> right. Yeah, Apple doesn't right. do the free thing unless, unless the government tells them to. <laughs> You know. Well, let's get into that. Uh, we'll sh- unless you had anything else to say about Xcode yeah. Cloud. I, I do have a couple of things. Yeah. Go ahead. So um, I, I'm with you on this, right? You know, Xcode Cloud doesn't have the killer feature yet, but we should preface all of this by saying it's still in beta. So, you know, they, they get a, a bit of a get out of jail free because it's not the committed final list of things, right? However... Part of that, I agree with you, Xcode needs an intervention, right? Because uh, I was both happy and sad when Interface Builder became part of Xcode because, great, now my designers (laughs) can't use a separate app. It does feel like this with with the Xcode Cloud, which is big problem with Xcode is it now does so much stuff. That's probably why it's so temperamental kind of thing. And huge to download. Let's not forget the download size. But I do, I wish it was a series of tools at this point. And I think it would be better to, for, from a maintenance perspective, for the engineers to work on it, for us, for just power up the bit that you need. Because I was going to say as well, you know, JetBrains app code, I really like it, but I can't commit to it as a serious tool when I still have to go back into Xcode and do some things because it's like, well, if I'm in there anyway, you know, um, yeah, like uh, maybe, and maybe the Swift, Swift playgrounds is kind of like they're dipping their toes into it to where you can like, yeah, just have a a single app. That's a Swift UI editor or something like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, don't you think that Swift playgrounds is starting to position itself as the equivalent of like visual studio code, something fast and snappy to do the quick things. Right. Right, commit it exactly. somewhere, walk away, right? Fantastic. That's what we need, right? I don't want to power up a full IDE. And there's a new JetBrains tool. We won't talk about it here, but I don't want to power up a full IDE tool to make one quick code edit. And, and to be honest, most of the times, if I need to do that, I'll even just use BB Edit or something like that. It's like, I just need to edit the, the, the text, right? And recommit. Yeah. And so I'll do yeah. that rather than power up Xcode. I've been using uh, Nova by the folks at Panic. Oh, I love that. App. I love it's been fantastic. Nova. Yeah, yeah, I, I love Nova. I'll have, there is stuff. Yeah. There's stuff like Swift format files or Swift linked files or get ignore files that I'll need to edit and they don't show up in Xcode. So I'm like, yeah, well, I guess I got to like load up a different text editor for it. It's like, right. Yeah. And I, it's right. fantastic. It's fast. It does what I need it to do. I do a lot of my web development stuff, you know, like like Compile Swift is sitting on Gatsby, which is sitting on top of React. I run all that stuff in Nova. It's beautifully fast. And, and you know, the yeah. Panic software team, I mean, my gosh, their tools are a pleasure to look at as well. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Speaking of 
Mac developers who know what they're doing. Yeah, um, exactly. If you ever need a perfect example of Mac apps, look at stuff by Panic. And the most beautiful Mac app ever, I think, is, you know, Clean My Mac just looks phenomenal. I wish I could design UIs like that. I guarantee that probably, well, I don't think Swift UI could do it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we talked about governments convincing Apple um, <laughs> last but not least. Like, so we're like, we've got a Fortnite case that's done, but then we have some other stuff that's still pending. There's just a lot like there, there is an overall pattern and I feel like next year we're going to see it too of like, well, you just got the USB-C thing. What do you think like all this stuff means for developers? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Because I will, I'll ask that first and let you, let you answer before I try to answer that question. Okay. So my thoughts on it is it's a good thing. And, and this is not, you know, this we're talking about Apple here, but this is kind of my opinion in general for, for any of these huge companies, right? You know, and often you see me on Twitter saying like Microsoft from the 90s, those kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. It is a good thing for both developers and users when a company is reminded that, hey, you don't just get to do what you want all the time, right? Now, that said, you know, like with the cases this year, with Apple, um, on the one hand, it's kind of that thing of great. We found a bit of a chink in the armor, and that they can lose at things. And I'm not saying whether that's good or bad. I'm just saying that you know we always assume like huge corporations are going to win every time. Clearly, that's not the case. But I also think that the the situation this year with the court cases that they lost and things like that are not as big a deal to developers as as maybe we want them to be and believe that they are. You know, yes, we can now tell folks some other way to get, get my app without the app store. But then you look at it and go, well, shouldn't it have been that way all along, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm like, <sighs> yeah. Uh, I think, like, what's unfortunate is that I don't like that Apple needs to be convinced and legislated that they can't or should do certain things because for one thing, like I'm worried that the app store is getting, well, it isn't like there's a lot of junk out there. Right. And like mm -hmm. Apple really hasn't done a good job. It, Apple has a weird way they do app review. It seems like where it's like, I'm sure they don't, allow a lot of junk, but there's still a lot of junk on the app store. But then at the same time, they won't like app review can be mixed, right? It can be one day oh, yeah. they allow something and the next thing they don't. And to me like that, that to me is like my biggest complaint. And then on top of it, on top of it, I don't think they do enough, not necessarily. They don't do enough for developers to encourage better apps if you know what i mean and this goes back to yes. the whole ipad thing like they need to come up with a better way to get companies to want to build better apps for ipad and mac or whatever platform they feel like needs more apps on there and i don't maybe they just don't care and that could be the case but um i don't know like that that seems like a big elephant in the room is like and i think they're definitely like making good steps in that direction certainly with like the stuff with um, with the cuts, changing the cups and improving that. And then I'm trying to think what was the other thing that they changed recently. And I, I think they're, they'll continue to do that. Um, yeah. But like, <clears throat> I don't, I, I, like, I'm not, I'm not a fan of alternative app store. I don't want that. Like, I, I'd rather have everything go through the app store because I don't think that's going to fix anything. But yeah. I, I also, like, think that we could get more consistency out of app review. And I think that would be more helpful um, than anything else. And just cleaning up a lot. Like, I'm a little, I'm a little bit worried that their, their, their whole services model is built on a lot of garbage apps. And that's kind of, um, kind of worrisome for me because we all talk about trying to make money from the app store and like there's a lot of garbage games out there that are making a ton of money and camp gambling games and things like that it's just like mm -hmm. like apple's gotta 
Apple's got to make if they're going to make money off the App Store or in services, they got to find a more solid way to do it. And I, I'm kind of thinking that's their direction, but they also need to clean up the App Store in a lot of ways with, yeah. with a lot of the garbage yeah. that's out there. You know what I mean? I do. I do. And I have some thoughts on, on a few of these things. So uh, first of all, I'm with you. I don't want any other App Stores. That That's just a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, OK, great. For the consumer, I get that because they're, well, it seems great for the consumer because they're going to be, yay, I can get stuff from all over the place. Right. And then you end up with that scenario, right, of we're already seeing some bad actors by way of software get into the app store itself. Multiply that by I don't know how many thousands of percent when you open it up to multiple app stores. Next thing you know, right, and this is also why I don't think we should see this happen because next thing you know, people are complaining, well, my iPhone's got this and a virus and full of junk and they're running slow and right, everything else. Right, exactly. And, and at that point, you know, if I was Apple, I'd be like, well, look, you installed this stuff. And they don't want that to happen. They don't need, right. you know, and they I don't hate want to that pick on Android, but yeah, they don't need this situation to happen and be like that, right? They have the right. ability, rightly or wrongly right now, to try to keep that experience good. And they should. Because you're paying, you know, premium prices for a premium device, which is right, exactly worth some money. I don't know if it's worth a thousand dollars, but um, you know, so you should get a certain level of experience and expect it. And I think a, one app store is a key factor on that. So I'm with Apple on this. Um, however, there is still bad stuff gets in the store. Ridiculous stuff gets in the store. I, I know from me personally, and I, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, I've submitted apps that, you know, an update that'll get sent back for an issue. And I've looked at it and gone, you know what, this issue was fine for the first four, past four releases over the previous year. When right. I send that feedback in and I, you know, and I say, look, please help me understand what I need to do. The next thing yeah. I know is it's just magically accepted, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah, exactly, and, and exactly. Yeah. I've had and this issue is too, where it's like, yeah, I've had like it, um, I don't know, gone to a committee or something and they're like, okay, yeah, that, it's fine. It's like, okay, what yeah. changed? And then, you know, I've issued updates and it's worked fine. And it's like the, the consistency for me is one of the biggest challenges I have as a developer with, yeah. with, a, with app review. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you fix it. And I don't know like what's going on there, but it's, it's a strange yeah. issue for me. It is. And I think, if you there's know, anything people, a business, if there's anything a business is built on, it's consistency and stability. And if you don't have that, it feels it's scary. Like, yeah. So, yeah, that's not that's not yeah. a good situation. And combine that with this, you know, like we were saying about building quality apps, quality prices, because they're they're worth that price. And I know both you and I, you know, we've paid for some some really good apps and paid the proper yeah. value, and I have no problem with that because I want right, the developers exactly. to stay vested and they're not going to do that at 99 cents a hit, right? I totally understand. As a developer, I don't I don't use apps that are free just precisely because I know it's like, if it's not backed by somebody that's solid, like it's probably not going to be maintained very long and that's going to suck. So yeah. yeah, that's like, that's actually part of my position on that. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we've seen some quality, you know, quality apps Quality companies, very well known on many, you know, Mac and so on, walk away from the App Store on iOS for the very reason that it's like, hey, there is nothing wrong with the quality of their products and I will pay for it without even questioning it because of their reputation. But they walk away because of this thing of I can't compete with, you know, 99 cents. I'm a business. It's not worth it. You know, right. And, and or they my just don't want to deal with the hassle of an app review or yeah, whatever it yeah. is. Exactly. See, and I was going to say, that's the other part here is all of this comes under the umbrella of, you know, this continuing problem of you want me to develop an app that you may, for your own reasons, valid or otherwise, determine can't go in the store. And you want me to invest time and money in that as a company. And, yeah. you know, from my perspective, right? So, you know, I, I I manage apps. I can't turn around to a company and say, you know, hey, uh, by the way, that thing that you we developed for six months is not being accepted. It's never going to get in the store. They won't let us do it. Yeah. Companies are not going to put up with that too many times, right? They'll just walk right. away and say, forget it. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll yeah, go back exactly, to the web app, exactly. you know. 
And, and you can't blame them at that point. And part of the problem is this inconsistency of the review. We've all joked about it, right? I think in some of the places we hang out where someone says, hey, it failed review. And someone says, just resubmit it. You'll get someone else and they may accept it. And that's a problem, yep. which works. That is a problem. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, at least we're not back in the days where it took a week or two weeks to get reviewed. So, oh, my um, gosh. So I want to give so credit. That's a big improvement. Yeah, I want to give credit to Apple on this. There have been times when I, you know, have, have like, oh, my gosh, I hope this review goes fast. And they have done it within hours. And I am so thankful for that. So whoever out there made that happen, thank yes. you. You know, yeah. 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 Uh, Anything else you want to talk about before I make my big announcement for 2022? Oh, no, I think, I th- I mean, there's so much that we could keep going for probably hours and hours and hours. But I think <laughs> we should stop and say like, okay, these are the things that we thought were going to be great. And some of them were. And these things we didn't even see coming, like the hardware. And we did. I think we've covered it. Yeah. What? I mean, yeah. I would sum it up and say, what a, overall, what an amazing year for us as developers. And I'm excited for 2022. Like, I don't think, I think things are definitely, we're a lot better positioned now than we were uh, three years ago, both on the app store, on hardware, in a lot of places. Um, So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful for 2022. Yeah. I feel like, uh, well, I'll make, so go ahead. I was going to say, I feel like, you know, I, I have been very critical over the past couple of years that I felt that Apple was losing its way and trying to be the the everything big box store for tech. I feel this year they've started to get back on that right path of, you know, okay, enough playing around. We need to take seriously everything we do and not just dabble with things. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we talked recently, we just talked about App Review and the App Store. Um, I'm going to be doing a new series of uh, podcast episodes in January, February, and March. I have uh, four to five episodes lined up where I'll be actually interviewing some indie developers in the community. Oh, cool. um, folks like uh, Charlie Chapman, uh, Mustafa Youssef, uh, Michael Tigras, um, Jordan Morgan. So um, if you have any questions about being an indie developer, reach out to me. Uh, the first Episode of the year will be with Charlie, who uh, does Dark Noise, amongst a few other indie apps. Um, so I'm really looking forward to putting out that series. Oh, yeah. So um, Empire Apps will be here next year, uh, <laughs> as busy yes, as I am. Good. So yeah. definitely, uh, I hope I hope to everybody has a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Happy holidays. Um, thank you, Peter, for coming on. Oh, thank you. I mean... You know, we I think we were both looking forward to this episode, but we knew it's going to be a problem because it's like, okay, we're going to have to stop ourselves at some point. So thank you for for having me on and, uh, you know, especially for the end of the year wrap up, which I feel is just such a great honor. So thank you, Leo, so much for this. And I'm super excited to to hear this new series. You know, I I love listening to people say about these things. Yeah, and I love to get indie developer stories and also like, you know, how they come up with ideas and and how that process goes. So I'm really I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to your uh, episode in uh, nine to ten months on ARKit um, and how it works and uh, how okay. to build an app for the glasses. So that would that, be fantastic. Too. Stay tuned for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll Thank you, Peter, for coming right on. Now. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. I, I appreciate it. I, I just, you know, I'm sure next year we'll be like, wow, we thought last year was big. We're going to have so much to talk about. So thank you so much. I agree. Where can people find you online, Peter? Uh, you can find me, Compile Swift, just about anywhere it's going to be me, but especially CompileSwift.com and, you know, Compile Swift on all the usual places. I guess I should promote one new one that I keep forgetting to do, which is I actually did set up CompileSwift.live which is where you can go directly there to see my live streams. I've actually now fully committed to doing live streams at the weekend. Um, I do one for apps and then one for some Sprite kit, which I'd never done anything with. So that's awesome. Live. Yeah. Is this on YouTube or uh, Twitch or where are you hosting that? Yeah, it actually goes out to Twitch and to YouTube. Uh, If you go to compulsive.live, it puts the live stream thing in there. But I always send out a tweet as well. So, you know, follow me on Twitter. 
but it goes out to YouTube, uh, Twitch, and Facebook, in fact. So awesome. uh, we have a great chat room in there, and some folks that we both know come in and tell me how terrible my code is and fix it. So it's great. I get a free session every week. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. I'll have to check that out. People Thank can you. find me on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. My company is Bright Digit. Take some time to uh, subscribe or comment or like on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on Google or um Apple Podcast or Amazon or Spotify, please take some time to post a review there. If you have any questions, reach out to me on Twitter. Thank you so much. And I look forward to talking to you next year on our episode with Charlie Chapman and Indie Developers. Thank you so much and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Bye.